To some, 1950s America was a classic time of wholesomeness. It was a post-World War I boom, a time when children could play outdoors, mothers baked apple pie, and fathers went to work in their smart suits, never without a hat. However, for one little boy, this experience was a world away. Cast aside like garbage, his life went unremembered and unclaimed. The only photo to document his existence was post-mortem and horrifically abused. He became known as a boy in the box. But just who was America's unknown child and who brutally murdered him? In the Ivy Hill Cemetery in Cedar Brook, Philadelphia, there sits a large plot kept almost entirely covered in stuffed animals, donated by local families and visitors. The headstone reads, America's unknown child. A permanent reminder of the child who lies beneath it. On average, in the United States, an estimated 460,000 children are reported missing every year. It's inconceivable to think that we're going to ask this question, but why was this boy in the box never reported missing? No one came forward to even provide his name. Despite the decades, the case remains open with the hope that one day someone will figure out the identity of the young victim and what happened to him. At this point in time, he's known as the boy in the box. In February of 1957, a man checking muskrat traps in the woods of Susquehanna Road in Fox Chase, Philadelphia made a horrific discovery. At first, he thought it was a doll, but shortly after, he realised it was something incomprehensible. What he found was a corpse of a young child discarded in a cardboard box, cast aside amongst the rusting appliances and garbage. Fearing that the police would confiscate his traps if he alerted them to the box, the young hunter ignored it and resumed hunting. I don't know the statistics, but delaying the investigation can only yield negative repercussions on the success rate of solving criminal cases. This behaviour disgusts me. It's selfish. For most people, the default human reaction would be to bring this to the attention of the police. Misprison of felony is a crime that occurs when someone knows a felony has been committed, but fails to inform the authorities about it. The crime originated in English common law and required that citizens report crimes or face criminal prosecution. A few days later, at 3.45pm on February 25th, 26-year-old Frederick J. Benonis, a La Salle College junior, claimed to be driving his car along Susquehanna Road when he saw a rabbit dash into a nearby thicket. Knowing there were animal traps in the area, he pulled over and went into the wooded area, where he too came across the body. The child had been wrapped in a blanket before being placed inside the box, and his head and shoulder were sticking out. According to Benonis, he believed the boy had actually been a doll and didn't contact the police about the discovery. The next day, Benonis was listening to the radio when he heard a report about a missing four-year-old girl. Believing what he'd seen the previous day was related, he contacted the police. When asked why he waited a day to report the discovery, he said he'd been spying on students of the nearby Good Shepherd School and didn't want the authorities to know why he was actually in the area. Unfortunately, the child in the box was not the missing girl, who was found deceased a week later in a vacant home where she'd wandered to and died of starvation. The area where the unidentified child was found is located in the 600 block of Susquehanna Road, near Vary Road and Pennyback Park, within northeast Philadelphia. The cold slows the decomposition process, so it was hard to know how long the boy had been dead. The coroner's report made for a grim reading, with one seasoned captain said to have been sick at the scene. Aged somewhere between 4 and 6, the boy was 40 inches tall and weighed just 30 pounds. He was of fair complexion, had blue eyes, light brown hair that had been cut crudely, possibly post-mortem given clumps of hair that were on the body. There were existing surgical scars to the boy's ankle and groin, plus an L-shaped scar under his chin. The bruises that covered his naked corpse and severe malnourishment suggested extensive abuse. The injuries had been long and sustained, 
covering much of his tiny frame, including his face. He died from massive head injuries. His body had been wrapped in a cheap rust and green coloured Indian patterned flannel blanket and placed inside a corrugated J.C. Penney's bassinet box. It was marked fragile, handle with care. The phrase, although a coincidence, seemed a mockery. The coroner's report contained many other intriguing details. The victim's right palm and soles of both feet were rough and wrinkled, which suggested that they had been submerged in water immediately before or after death. When exposed to ultraviolet light, the boy's left eye fluoresced a bright shade of blue, indicating recent exposure to a diagnostic dye used in the treatment of chronic eye disease. Spellman attributed the boy's death to head trauma, probably inflicted with a blunt instrument, which prompted some of the investigators to suggest that fatal damage had been inflicted by someone squeezing the boy's head when he was given his last botched haircut. The boy in the box investigation was put at a disadvantage from the very beginning. The first person never reported the dead body, and several days later, the college student delayed calling the police. Philadelphia Police Department opened the investigation on February 26, 1957, and took the fingerprints of the boy, confident that the case would be resolved quickly. The news featured prominently in local media across Philadelphia and into the Delaware Valley, with the Philadelphia Inquirer printing 400,000 flyers. Detectives even dressed the corpse and photographed it in a sitting position, and distributed the pictures in the hope that the more lifelike appearance would jog someone's memory. The images were posted across the area and included with every gas bill sent out in the city. Newspapers quickly dubbed the victim, the boy in the box. Police visited every children's home, foster home and hospital in the area, ensuring that every child was accounted for. The scene of the find was scoured by 270 police recruits to ensure that no clues had been missed. They discovered a man's blue Ivy League cap, a child's scarf and a man's white handkerchief with the letter G in the corner. They received tips and inquiries from concerned parents across the country, all wondering if the boy might be their missing child. The wealth of information seemingly produced hundreds of tantalizing points of interest. That was until the trail went cold and their leads vanished into the cold winter air. William H. Kelly, then a fingerprint expert for the Philadelphia Police Department had this to say. At first we figured the boy's family would come forward. Say his death was an accident and offer some sort of explanation. But that didn't happen. Days and weeks passed, and still he wasn't identified. Investigators focused on the boy's makeshift coffin, the cardboard box. It had originally held a baby bassinet from J.C. Penney, and was one of a dozen received on November 27, 1956, and sold for $7.50 between December 3rd 1956 and February 16, 1957, from a store in Upper Darby, Pennsylvania. The store kept no record of individual sales, but the other 11 bassinets were eventually located by detectives. FBI fingerprint technicians found no usable prints on the carton recovered from the empty lot. The examination of the blanket proved to be just as frustrating. It was made from cheap cotton flannel and had been recently washed and mended using poor grade cotton thread. It had been cut into two separate unequal pieces and then wrapped around the naked boy. Analysis at the Philadelphia Textile Institute determined that it had been manufactured either at Swanoa, North Carolina or Granby, Quebec. Identical blankets had been produced by the thousands and the police were never able to figure out a likely place where it had been sold. A label inside of the blue cap led police to Robbins Eagle Hat and Cap Company in Philadelphia. Hannah Robbins said that it was one of 12 that had been made from corduroy remnants at some point prior to May 1956. Robbins recalled the particular hat because it had been made without the leather strap 
But the purchaser, a blonde man in his late 20s, had returned a few months later to have a strap sewn on. Robbins told the detectives that her customer resembled photographs that she was shown of the boy in the box, but she had no record of his name or address. When no one came forward to claim the boy in the box, the Philadelphia detectives who handled the child's case paid for the boy's funeral. They initially buried the boy in Potter's Field near Mechanicsville with a stoner marker, Heavenly Father, bless this unknown boy. The simple headstone also included the boy's date of discovery, February 25th, 1957. After officials exhumed his body in 1998, they reburied him in Philadelphia's Ivy Hill Cemetery with a new granite headstone, America's Unknown Child, a bench which the Vidocq Society donated as well as the child's original marker are also at the boy's gravesite. The case went cold, silent and deathly still until November 4th, 1998, when the boy in the box was exhumed in order to extract DNA samples collected for future comparison with any suspected relatives. A year passed before the authorities finally admitted that they had not been able to obtain a satisfactory DNA profile for the boy's remains. Another attempt was made in 2000 this time from the boy's teeth, but this attempt also failed. Although the discovery of any living relative seems fairly hopeless at this point, some investigators have remained optimistic. In 1999, Frank Bender, a forensic artist and a founding member of the Vidocq Society, came up with a new idea that he believed might help solve the case. The Vidocq Society is a crime-solving organization that is based out of Philadelphia. The group is named for Eugene Francois Vidocq, the groundbreaking 19th century French detective who helped police by using criminal psychology to solve cold case homicides. At meetings, the members, forensic professionals, current and former FBI profilers, homicide investigators, scientists, psychologists, Prosecutors and coroners listen to law enforcement officials who come from around the world to present unsolved cases for review. Bender sculpted a bust that he believed could bear a strong resemblance to the dead boy's father. The case was profiled for a national television audience on America's Most Wanted, but no leads were discovered. Regardless, efforts to identify the boy continue. Former medical examiner's office employee Remington Bristow felt a personal connection to the case and worked hard to find a resolution. In the hopes of bringing the boy's parents out of hiding, he published a fake story in the local newspapers, claiming his death had been an accident and that his loved ones had been unable to afford a funeral. Unfortunately, this tactic was unsuccessful. Bristow also personally put a $1,000 reward for information and travelled to Arizona and Texas in the pursuit for leads. He was known to carry a mask of the boy's face in his briefcase. A case with more questions and answers and more dead ends and conclusions gave rise to many theories. While all of them seem to make sense, each has a missing piece in this jigsaw puzzle. The first theory is the foster home. One of the most thoroughly researched theories in the case is the boy had been the child of a girl who lived at a foster home located one and a half miles away from where the body had been found. This theory was one Remington Bristow heavily focused on, and he believed the boy in the box had been the son of Anna Marie Nicoletti, stepdaughter of Arthur Nicoletti, the man who ran the home. According to Bristow, Anna Marie, who is said to have been mentally challenged, had four children out of wedlock three who had been stillborn, and the other who had died after being electrocuted in 1955 outside a supermarket. It's believed the boy's death was accidental, and the result of the family not wanting word to get out that Anna Marie was an unwed mother. In 1960, Bristow contacted a New Jersey-based physic, who had told him to look for a house that matched the description of the foster home. When he later brought her to the dump site, she led him directly to the home. Later, Upon attending an estate sale at the home, he discovered a bassinet that resembled the one sold at J.C. Penney, as well as a blanket that looked similar to the one that the boy had been found wrapped in. Investigators have looked at this angle numerous times over the years, 
but have found no evidence to support that the Nicolettis were involved in the boy's death. DNA testing done later proved that he was not Anna Marie's son. The second theory is the Lady M. Another prominent theory in the case is that he was a victim of human trafficking and suffered severe physical and sexual abuse. This came after a Cincinnati, Ohio-based psychiatrist contacted investigators after a patient by the name of either M, Mary or Martha told her she wished to speak to them. According to M, her abusive mother had purchased a boy from his parents when she was 11 years old, saying she distinctly recalled her mother handing his parents an envelope in exchange for the boy. After that, both he and she were subjected to years of sexual and physical abuse, which eventually resulted in his death. She shared that one evening, he threw up his dinner of baked beans, which led him to being beaten into a semi-conscious state. While his mother tried to clean him up in the bath, he died. In an attempt to conceal this death, M and her mother traveled to the Fox Chase neighborhood in Philadelphia. When they were preparing to remove his body from the trunk of the car, a motorist pulled over, thinking they'd gotten a flat tire. M had attempted to conceal the car's license plate, and upon her mother denying his request to help, the motorist drove away. After hearing this story, numerous investigators were convinced of the plausibility, as M touched upon aspects only investigators were aware of, including a 1957 statement from a man who claimed to have witnessed a mother and her child pulled over in the area around the time the boy was found. There was also the fact parts of his body were water wrinkled, which supported the idea he'd been bathed before his death. However, skepticism was abound, as a search of a home uncovered no evidence and interviews with neighbours revealed that no such boy had been living at the home during that time period. Upon her name being released through a media outlet, M fled the country and police have yet to say where she relocated. The third theory. The boy was actually a girl. A third theory in the case is that the boy may have been raised a girl. This is associated with the release of the 1957 sketch of him with long hair and is supported by his unusual haircut and the strands of hair on his body. According to reports, his eyebrows also appear to have been styled. Theory number four, the Hungarian immigrant. A theory that was quickly ruled out surrounded the possibility of that the boy in the box was a Hungarian immigrant whose family came to the United States in the 1950s. This was seen as unlikely as immigrants at the time were required to be vaccinated and the boy in the box did not have a vaccination scar and the boy he was believed to be was located with his family in North Carolina. Theory number five. Kenneth and Irene Dudley. David Stout, author of The Boy in the Box, The Unsolved Case of America's Unknown Child, has theorized that the boy in the box's parents were likely poor, possibly carnival or migrant workers who would have been able to travel without a paper trail. This theory is supported by the 1961 arrest of carnival workers Kenneth and Irene Dudley after the seven-year-old daughter was found deceased in a wooded area in Virginia wrapped in a blanket with signs of abuse and maltrition. Several of their children had also gone missing, with many having passed away as a result of neglect and abuse, but none of them were found to have been the unidentified boy. Theory number six, Memphis, Tennessee. Two authors have suggested that the boy is the deceased brother of a man currently living in Memphis, Tennessee. After speaking to a Philadelphia resident, they learned of a family who had rented a home from him. They had sold their son and suddenly left the area not long after the news of the murder of the boy in the box, leaving behind items that were seen as necessary for everyday life. Philadelphia's former assistant medical examiner was questioned about this, and he noted that there were similarities between the boy in the box, his potential father, and his potential brother, particularly in the nose facial structure and the ears. He said these similarities alone were enough to warrant further testing. DNA from the man in Memphis was obtained in 2014, but investigators stated that they needed more evidence in order to have it tested. This finally occurred in December 2017, which confirmed there was no family connection. And so the case remains unsolved. Despite the huge amount of publicity at the time and sporadic re-interest throughout the years, the case remains unsolved to this day, 
and the boy's identity is still unknown. Today, in America, 40% of murder cases are unsolved, a rather bleak number. It's hard to know whether or not the delay in informing the police would have had any meaningful impact in the success of the case for the boy in the box. Today, the failure to report such an offence without a reasonable excuse comes with a maximum penalty of two years imprisonment. The boy in the box would be around 70 years old if he was still alive today. The world will never know how his life would have turned out, whether he would have lived an everyday life filled with family, work and community, or perhaps an extraordinary one highlighted by great contributions to society. This story depicts two worlds, the one of American innocence and our more modern brutal world. Maybe it exposes the truth that innocence never really existed at all. I want you to look at a six-year-old you know. It could be a son, daughter, niece or nephew. I personally don't have kids, but I have a niece and nephew who are of the same age as a boy in the box and I see innocence, playfulness, intelligence, curiosity, but ultimately an opportunity, an opportunity to do something great in society, have an impact on people's lives and ultimately live a great life. The case leads me to question fellow human beings. One where a small child seemingly abused throughout his life, is discarded as if he had been worth no more than the garbage strewn all around. A life that apparently went unmissed, with nobody to remember his all too brief existence. Yet, in the aftermath of this monstrous crime, we see the good in ourselves. We see individuals such as Bristow and Kelly, determined in their quest for truth and justice, determined to be the ones who remember. A lot of positive changes have been made to child protection since the 1950s, but it's the notion of having to intervene with a child's relationship with their biological parents which is a somber subject to fathom. A professional assessor deems a child's future, development and sometimes even their lives are in jeopardy if they were to remain in that household, so they are disconnected from the only environment they know something much different to most, and then injected into a habitat more conducive of natural human behaviour, assuming they will assimilate into society normally. We expect them to adapt and grow into normal human beings, but we can't overlook the long-term repercussions on a child's psychology as a result of this instability and lack of biological connection with their parents. While we may never hold a concrete answer to the mystery, we must ensure that we remember the boy in the box.